Hello everyone, it's Gigabeef here, and as you may or may not be aware, this wipe in patch 13.5, the 762x39BP craft in the hideout was removed. This is not new, but Tarkov social media is ablaze with various issues right now, so we're going to talk about some of these hot topics, including endgame ammo and specifically BP, global limits, the ratting meta, and the ongoing discussions about find and raid. Let's start off with one of the easier topics, endgame ammo, and this can generally be summed up by the whole conversation around 762x39BP. So BP, being an endgame cartridge, takes down class 5 armor users to the thorax in 2 hits 50% of the time, and certainly in 3, and because we don't see that much class 6 armor in the game, is extremely popular all the way through the wipe as soon as people can get access to it. When you can get access to BP keeps changing, so originally it was on Punisher Part 6 and on the traders, then it was behind Grenadier, and again on the traders, then it went craft only, and this wipe you have to be level 45 to complete a relatively easy task called Intimidator, but now you can't craft it in the hideout at all. There's two sides of the argument to this, one set of players say that it's too powerful to be put on the traders because everybody ends up using it all the time as soon as they reach it. The other side of the argument says that if you put it on the traders and put it too high then it means that nobody else will be able to get it who doesn't grind all wipe to achieve that particular quest. It was an interesting experiment in the last wipe to have it craft only because it meant that it restricted the supply so much and stopped it from being rife in kind of the mid towards the end game. But I do feel sorry a little bit for the players who play a lot more than the average person because they effectively get less BP per raid than some who only plays sort of three to four raids per night. In my mind though, these two different types of work I guess that the game gets you to do in order to access these higher tier bullets are both valid. There's nothing wrong with grinding all the way up to level 50 and completing an annoying quest to unlock a piece of ammo, and there's nothing wrong with waiting for 12 hours to allow ammo to craft in the hideout by spending the resources and upgrading to that point. At this stage, I think we should just do both and give these things two routes to unlock. A, grind it chad mode and get rewarded, be able to buy it every reset, not in unlimited quantity but with some personal limit, and this also only applies to a small proportion of the player base, remember. These guys have so much more experience, they'll probably kill you anyway even if they don't have BP, so as an average player, you shouldn't worry too much about it. For everyone else, you're able to get to workbench level 3, craft it and then stack it with PP or PS and manage with your limited ammo, and it's better that way than not being able to unlock it at all like it is in this wipe. Tarkov basically asks players to do work to unlock certain achievements, and here we're just getting different types of players to do different types of work depending on how they like to play. One other thing that I would like to see though is tiering in terms of ammo spawns, so that you could go to a specific area and go to farm ammo of a particular type. You wouldn't know exactly which ammo you're going to get, but I'd quite like it to be split between low tier, medium tier, and high tier. And also you could even split it for NATO versus Eastern. So on certain maps, on certain places like Woods you set Camp, you could have a Western spawn there, a high tier loot spawn, so you're going to get good 556, you're going to get 51 NATO, or you can get 338, something like that. Whereas on Reserve, maybe you could get the high tier spawns for the Eastern ammos instead, 545 and 762 by 54 r So we mentioned a little bit about global limits before, and I understand why BSG wants global limits to be in the game because they want the game to be about scarcity and not everyone to have access to everything at the same time. But unfortunately, global limits just don't really work in Tarkov, and the ultimate player behavior that you get out of global limits is things that are good being in extremely high demand and people having to camp the traders. Camping the traders is one of the worst mechanics in Tarkov, which effectively means the people who can be online all day can get the stuff when they want, and the people that can't can just never ever get it. It just doesn't make sense, and it's one of the most toxic things about the game. There's also no kind of time zone scaling at all on these mechanics whatsoever, which I think is very unfortunate. If you're trying to buy something, you're much better off trying to do it in the early hours of the EU morning rather than trying to buy something in the evening or in kind of the NA hours evening peak. At that point your 400 ammo boxes go so much less far because there's so many more players playing at that time. As a start, the quantities for these things really should just piggyback off the active number of players in-game at that one time for that particular reset, which at least makes it fair for different players around the globe playing at different times. The only idea that I really have about making this slightly better is perhaps there could be some kind of queuing system where you can choose one item across all of the traders that you'll be guaranteed an allocation for regardless of the limit. For example, FMJ SX for the MP7, so Peacekeeper has it out of stock, you put your request in for that, you can only request for one item, so FMJ is going to be your item for, you know, the next sort of cycle period and when it comes through it allocates all of those people their ammo before the new limit comes into place. Maybe there's some system like that that we can work around that keeps BSG's vibe while actually making sense but basically if there is no better way to do it then the global limits should just be removed for the time being and keep them to personal only because right now they just don't work. So on to finding raid. There's a lot of people talking about finding raid always but it's resurfaced again recently with questions of could we just remove finding raid and the game was better before finding raid. Now one of the biggest problems with the whole finding raid conversation is that finding raid was brought in to deal with certain aspects of the game that were very very bad before. Namely, 
Hatchlings, i.e. people going in with just a melee weapon, running into high loot spot areas, putting high value items in their secure container, dying and selling them on the flea. Trader resales, i.e. being able to level quickly, speed through the trader progression, buying stuff from the traders and then relisting it on the flea market for massive profits. Buying through quests, i.e. finding raid stuff that you need for quests you could just purchase on the flea market and hand into the trader, just skipping that quest completely with a little bit of money. And early wipe progression, which finding raid has sort of helped to alleviate a little bit. I would argue actually that the flea bands have been more important for this, but finding raid plays some small role. So the problem is that any new solution needs to fix all of these things and I've done a video in the past trying to take a step back and look at a global view on some mechanics that would allow this to happen which wasn't the perfect solution by any means but it shows you the idea of the thought process you have to go through in order to come to a solution that is actually good. Take hatchlings for example, at one point the game was completely plagued with these guys. You'd go into a raid on shoreline and three quarters of the PMC slots would just be filled with people with no gear whatsoever just sprinting into resort with keys, going to grab GPUs, LEDXs, whatever it is that they could find, put in their secure container and dying. This made the game extremely stale in a lot of raids because there weren't really any people fighting and people were just looting to resell stuff on the flea market and it was truly terrible. Possible solutions to the hatchling thing is either to add lots of scabs to the high value areas or alternatively you could just lock the secure container completely which I'll come on to a little bit later but some of those things you can do to make hatchlings not a thing anymore. Buying through the quests is one of the easiest ones to solve because you can just keep finding raid as it is at the moment like maybe call it something else and you can just have that mechanic determine quest hand-ins rather than anything on the flea. Trader resales is a bit more complicated I did last time have a framework that I do think works quite well which allowed you to buy from the traders and not be able to share it with your teammates so they still couldn't sell it on the fleet but opponents of yours could be able to do it. If you're interested in that then go and watch the previous video I did about finding raid but I do think that there are some ways of removing finding raid whilst keeping the intended effects that we had previously. So when I mentioned early white progression a little bit ago I said that flea bans were more important and the reason why this is is because a lot of people talk about finding raid as removing the ability for people to sell players gear on the market. This stops PvP being anywhere near as profitable as it used to be but I do think that you can respect the flea bans and also allow player gear to be sold on the flea market because a lot of the issues are actually fixed by the flea bans themselves. I do believe that you can't remove the flea bans without destroying the early wipe but what this does mean is that if you kill somebody say with a trooper on that you could resell that trooper on the flea market. If you kill somebody with an M4 and with meta parts you could sell those on the flea market as well just like you can at the moment. If an opponent that you down has BP762 in their magazines well that can't be sold because it's flea banned but if they have 545 PP then that can be sold. I think that selling player gear that you found in raid is honestly probably fine so long as it respects the flea bans. One thing that I will note at this point is that it's a little odd to me that all class 4 armors aren't allowed on the flea market. Some of them are banned and some of them aren't. Some of the best like the trooper are allowed but then some of the other rigs aren't allowed. I understand why 5 and 6 aren't allowed on there but lots of stuff defeats class 4 so I think that all of them should be allowed on the flea. Interestingly Landmark's take on this in general was increased trader buyback percentage on guns, ammo, attachments, armor etc to 90% of the original purchase price. If BSG don't want to change the flea this makes looting from pvp way more valuable. What was interesting about this was that I proposed exactly this in the video that I did previously and I even went one step further and said that they should increase the price for dog tags by at least five times just to begin with. Alongside this increase the trader repurchase value for the banned items to some sensible amount let's say 80 to 90 percent of the item's original price. Many people were saying that this would allow teammates to cheese dog tags off each other but BSG actually implemented this so that dog tags off teammates now only cost one ruble when you're selling them to the traders so they already put in the groundwork to be able to increase the prices they just never did. As a short term solution yeah this is fine but as we've discussed there's a lot more that BSG can do to remove fine and raid but still keep the effects that they want in the game. Now I want to take what Deadly Slob said and just analyse this for a second. He said possible hot take Tarkov's loot economy is the strongest it's ever been. Fine and raid has been a net positive for the game. RMT, hatchet runs, questing progression was just wild, content burnout was significant, players complained constantly about ammo and armour. Grass isn't greener on the other side, we've played the game with open flea for a long time, the changes happened to the market are consequences of problems that needed to be resolved. That being said, crafting times are dumb and should be changed. So what's interesting here is that although I actually don't really like Finding Raid that much and never have, the outcome on the game I do think has been good and it's exactly what Deadly said, it's a net positive for the game. Finding Raid isn't perfect because it introduces some weirdness into the game and makes the system quite unintuitive for new players. I'm just going to invoke the Veritas chart here for a moment which shows you the decision tree as to whether something is going to be Finding Raid or not and nobody can argue that it's intuitive in any way. But Deadly's position is a position that a lot of people find themselves in, not really liking Finding Raid but feeling that the outcomes are kind of necessary. Necessary. One other angle to the whole finding raid thing is cheating and RMT or real money trading, people paying actual money out of the game to pay for goods in game. 
This has always been a problem in Tarkov because it incentivizes people to cheat, to go and get the vast amount of gear, rubles, whatever it is they need to then on sell onto people paying real money and sets up a direct economic loop for those people to do so. RMT itself, while annoying, has never really been the problem. It's really about the cheating that's the main issue. Prior to finding Raid, what a cheater could do is go into Shoreline, speed hack or whatever it is, run all the way up to Shoreline Resort, take a Ledex, put it in their secure container and extract out of the map. They then go into a raid with a paying customer in Factory for example, they go to one of the extracts, they pass the Ledex over, they put it in their secure container and then they can sell it on the flea market for rubles themselves. When finding raid and a lot of the other restrictions on the player base came in, such as not being able to transfer keys, not being able to drop tons of hideout items on the floor, item restrictions on the actual players, how many bitcoins you can hold, stims, this kind of thing, this incentivized cheaters to do something else. The most prevalent kind of cheat now instead is the carry service. So players go in with a large backpack who are cheating, they go in with a somebody who's paid, which doesn't have any gear on at all, they then go around the map, they kill players and they loot the whole thing and then they hand over all of the loot over to the person who paid for the carry. So you can see the issue with these two types of cheats. The first type of cheater who's taking loot off the map, like yeah sometimes they would have to kill people, but normally they just want to extract with as much valuable loot as they can. So what happens to the main player is that they go to various rooms and the map has just not got much high tier loot in. This is extremely difficult to detect for an individual person and who knows maybe it's just down to loot pools it's maybe I've just got unlucky it's very difficult because it's all anecdotal. Nowadays when people run into these cheaters who are doing carry service they just get killed because their gear is going to be transferred onto the person who paid for it. This is also much worse for people who go to hit hotspots and those who play a lot and play in a chad kind of mentality especially those who bring good gear as well because those are the people who are probably going to be targeted more likely than somebody who's wearing something not very valuable. So the argument that I've seen is that people would rather fight hatchlings versus carry service cheaters and by removing finding raid you're basically letting cheaters go back to hoovering up items on the map and transferring it to paying customers who sell these things on the flea market making their lives easier rather than carrying them through the map killing legitimate players. Unfortunately at this point I do actually see some validity to this argument. Cheaters are going to cheat anyway, it's very very difficult for BSG to do it even if they're spending resources and time trying to prevent these people and so you may as well reduce the impact on actual players which yes it might result in an increase in RMT but it's certainly better than the alternative. But of course the real onus here is on BSG themselves, firstly detecting and banning cheaters which is easier said than done and secondly detecting and banning people who do RMT with transfers which can also be hard depending on how it's done in raid. So if it is going to happen anyway you know perhaps it is time to release some of these harder restrictions around RMT such as passing low to medium value keys and hideout items to teammates or the number of X valuable item you can hold in raid at once, the number of bags you can have on you etc. These things disproportionately hurt actual players that aren't cheating and haven't helped with RMT that much seemingly. Another victim of the changes around RMT are actually some of the wow moments of the game. Finding a coloured keycard or a ledex is kind of all that is left whereas back in the day you could find sick cases, weapons cases, bring in thick items cases or junk boxes yourself for extreme high stakes runs. All of this is gone now because of RMT restrictions and that's a bit sad. Tarkov looting has become a game of 10 to 20k item per slot maximization of ruble values on the flea market which honestly is a bit boring. I don't really enjoy the looting process very much and this is partly why. One final thing about finding raid is the criticism that it makes people play scared because of preventing players from banking a win such as a GPU and then being able to fight and retain its finding raid status. I think there is certainly something to this but I don't think it's necessarily the most important one. I mean we do want to kind of keep keep some of Tarkov's intensity and so I don't think we necessarily want to get rid of the mechanic that allows people to just go into raid and grab a hideout item or a quest item and then just die with it. More importantly this mechanic at the moment is what prevents hatchling type gameplay and I have seen a few people that suggest locking the container which I'm actually not against but this does exactly the same thing except it doubles down on the concept. Rather than finding a GPU and being able to sell it on the flea you can now only use it in your own hideout. If you lock the container you now can't have it at all if you die. This would lead to even more incentive to leave raids when you find something good. As I said I'm not actually against locking it but attempting to use it as a solution to stop hatchlings in the event finding raid did get removed moved is inconsistent with people who want to promote PvP and basically does the same thing as the system now but has even more of an effect. So this leads us on neatly to the meta of patch 13.5, the camping or ratting meta. You move, you die has become the phrase du jour because it's kind of true, moving around the map is hard and a lot of this is down to audio. Why people are afraid to move around the map is because you can be heard from an extremely long distance away and once players hear each other in Tarkov typically they stop moving at that point and wait for the other person to run into your sights because it's just an easy kill. First off I think the range of audio is now far too high, this seems to have gotten even bigger with the headset rework and yeah players hear each other from such a ridiculous distance and is the point at which people stop moving because why should you? you 
only give away positional information when you do and you have to push into a silent defender. The odds are so stacked against you. When I was talking with people on Twitter about this, Dan Exert made a very good point about the extreme compression of some of the headsets, which makes it very hard to judge distance correctly. There should be some tweaking of these done so that there is a more distinct sound for different ranges, especially close up, because sometimes people sound like they're right on top of you, but in fact they're 10 meters away. One interesting benefit of having the hearing range be less extreme is that you would be able to tell distances more easily because the increase in volume wouldn't be spread out over such a large distance like it is now. So rather than going from zero to 100 on volume, from zero to 100 meters, it would go from zero to 100 volume from you know 50 meters down to right up next to you. So it would be more obvious when someone goes from 10 to zero than 10 to zero in the 100 meter situation, if that makes sense. Omni Actual has put together a headset comparison and he's got a whole video on that on YouTube if you want to go and give it a watch. But there's a table that he has popularized showing different ranges of different headsets. And in the most extreme scenario, if someone is super overweight, say 70 kilograms, and you're wearing contact fours, you can hear them running from 91 meters away, which is absolutely insane. Even in a relatively ordinary scenario, with some ordinary headsets like the XL, you can hear somebody walking unencumbered from 60 meters away. This is far too far. The only way to avoid this mechanic at the moment is to stop as soon as you hear somebody and start crouch walking, which at the moment is silent, even though it doesn't sound silent to you. But the problem here is that you can't flank, you can't really move, you can't really do anything. It's hard to even aim down sights without somebody hearing you from 30 meters away. This goes for flanking as well. If you try to take an alternative route around, typically people can just still hear you and just track you through the walls. So even running back, running around and coming back in, they'll just shoot you again because they were stationary and they could hear you the entire time when you were running. So alongside the audio thing, the SVT and the AVT haven't helped this wipe and although there are other ways to take down more geared players and there always have been such as shotguns and the KS-23, these are the best bang for buck method to do it and they work in a higher variety of situations than some of their predecessors. 762x54R BT and SNB ammo specifically are making these weapons progressively more overpowered as there are a few cartridges that deal with class 5 so readily. As the player base moves into using these armors more frequently, Frequently, these guns retain exactly the same time to kill as they did versus class 4 with LPS and T46, which is two shots to the chest. There are big downsides to both of these weapons, so they're not necessarily overpowered per se, but when combined with the current meta of sitting still and being able to hear people from a million miles away, they have clearly become very popular for giving the best bang for buck success chance with the least kit investment. One other issue that we should talk about is that players are rightfully scared of running into cheaters if they go geared. Whether anecdotal or not, it is perceived that you are at a higher risk of getting killed by a hacker if you bring good gear, and it makes sense in the context of increased carry services. Unfortunately, as we said before, this is exclusively down to BSG, but until it's proven that the situation is more under control, and exactly how BSG does this I don't really know, but some players will continue to question bringing in expensive kits and instead opt for more of those mid-tier, just about good enough ones to play whilst keeping cheaters in mind, which naturally includes the SVT and the AVT. So what are my overall takeaways from this video? Bring back the craft for BP and other similar ammo and provide two routes to it, one the chad route and one the crafting route. For global limits, if we can't think of anything better to do, just remove it for the time being and keep it personal only. We'll find in raid, if it's not going to be changed in any meaningful way, at least increase the trader buyback of kits to 90% of their purchase price and include dog tags in that as well. As for find in raid itself, my revised thoughts are stop hatchlings by locking the secure container in raid, because I think this is probably the best solution. Trader resales can be fixed using the algorithm that I designed in the previous previous video that I still think stands and is good. Buying through quests is easily resolved by just using the finding raid system as it is now and making it only apply to questing. And early white progression can be retained by ignoring the finding raid side but keeping the flea bands as they are. As for the current meta, some of this might be helped by the changes that we've just talked about, but I really do think that the audio for the headsets needs to be reduced so that players can move around the map without hearing other people from 90 meters away. And that's basically it. Any thoughts in the comments below? And have fun in your raids.